Professor Dr. Michael Friedrich Hahn, who is a professor for photogrammetric and geometric geometrics at the Stuttgart University of Applied Sciences, Germany. He obtained diploma Messi in geodesy from University of Karlsruhe in 1993 and obtained his PhD in technical sciences from University of Stuttgart in 1994. Professor Hahn held a number of academic and administrative positions during his tenure to date. He was the Vice President Stuttgart University of Applied Sciences in 2001 to 2007, Course Director International Master's Course in Photogrammetry and Joe and jo Informatics in 1998 to 2001 and was the Deputy Director of the Institute of Photogrammetry at the Stuttgart University in 1994 to 1996. He was also an honorary professor at the University of Queensland, Brisbane, Australia. Besides that, he had visited and guest professorships in former Ken Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology in Kenya, University of Western Australia, University of Calgary, Canada, University of Technology, Malaysia, Kathmandu University, Tehran University, and Ohio University, USA. Professor Hahn has contributed significantly to the field of photogrammetry, remote sensing, image processing, geoinformatics, navigation, and statistics, parameter estimation, evidenced by his extensive list of publications. These include four books, editor, many invited papers, around 20 keynote papers and over 150 papers published in academic journals, conference and workshop proceedings. He organized and participated in organizing many national and international conferences. Professor Hahn has been <coughs> engaging in leading researchers as the principal investigator and co-principal investigator of over 30 research projects and has successfully led highly competitive research grants in his area of research, including, and he obtained grants from German Research Foundation, the Federal Ministry of Education and Research, Ministry of Science, the Federal Office of Military Geosciences, the European Union, Carl Zeiss Research, and numerous small grants funded by the university. He holds research funding of over Euro 2,500,000 since 2001, of which 15% came from the industry. Um, getting funding from the industry is a tribute which is not so easy these days. Professor Hahn is a member of many professional organization, organizations and was the chairperson of working groups of the International Society for Photogrammetric and remote sensing from 1992 to 2008. We'll be all uh, fortunate to listen to Professor Michael Frederick. Thank you very much. Is it working? Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Pereira, for this introduction. And uh, I want to welcome you also now to my presentation. Um, I'm photogrammetrist, as you heard and I try to show you lots of photos. So that's my profession, so showing you lots of graphs and images and hopefully, um, I know it's uh, late in the afternoon, so hopefully I can entertain you also a little bit with this. Yeah, I'm going to talk about mobile mapping. As you can see, it's a part of geodetic uh, data capture, of geodesy or swaying, and um, mobile mapping is a topic which I just try to bring a bit closer to you. I'll give a short introduction by reviewing the development of mobile mapping, um, shortly look at what is the basics or what is the fundamentals of um, mobile mapping, and of course then mainly show examples and uh, applications in this field. So this graph here, what you see is uh, 
yeah, showing, let's say, in decades, divided in decades, what happened in mobile mapping at the very beginning in the 80s, last century, there was uh, digital cameras newly on the market. The first ones appeared. We had GPS. Everybody nowadays has uh, GPS, or most of you have GPS in your mobile phone. At this time, it was still fairly new. And uh, the first mobile mapper, people, people who did mobile mapping, they uh, saw this opportunity. Bring the cameras together with the GPS, connect them somehow, and record imagery which has a location, which, where you know where you are, even in a world-centered coordinate system. Then there is a phase, 1990 to 2000, uh, where we introduced uh, laser scanners. So lasers which uh, could be used for capturing this room, for example, put the laser scanner in the room and it will capture the room in 3D with point clouds. Uh, this laser scanning was developed in the 90s and it was immediately combined again with GPS for mobile mapping. 2000 to 2010, uh, um, is the, was the time or is the time where airborne, this is that ALS, airborne laser scanning, um, became mature. So if you want to create, let's say, um, a digital height model of Sri Lanka, you want to know the height with a raster, let's say, of one meter, uh, everywhere in the, in, in the country you use airborne laser scanning. Or you can use airborne laser scanning and you just capture the surface through these point clouds. Of course, you imagine there is trees and buildings above it, so you have to process the data to get really the ground. And maybe this period now, 2010 to 2020, <coughs> is not yet decided, but this might be the, the decade where these UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, or RPAs, remotely piloted aircraft, uh, will, get, will, will have the breakthrough. We have many conferences worldwide now where these... Uh, UAVs are used for recording data and are developed, you know, to just fly around and capture um, information about the scene, about the ground, about uh, the environment. Yeah, um, the history started probably in U.S. at the Ohio State University around 1990, and we see here this first stage. Basically, what we see here on the on the graph, maybe I used mouse, possible. This one is nothing else than just a camera. On the right side, another one. In the center, a GPS, uh, um, GPS receiver and, uh, or a GPS antenna. The receiver is somewhere in the car. And that was enough to record information, for example, driving along the highways. So highway mapping, highway inventory was developed. And, um, of course, these people in surveying, they had not been happy just to, to take GPS as it is, a simple one. They dif did it differentially. That's why I call it DGPS. So differential GPS means you, you use the GPS receiver on your van and you use a second one, at this time at least, use a second one which you put into the field. And then by taking the differences, you get vectors in space and they are more accurate than what you get from a... From a satellite above. And uh, you see here the accuracy level which I mentioned was in the decimeter to meter range already at this time. Even though it has not this much improved until now, the techniques became more flexible, but we are still moving around with those vents or with other ones now in the decimeter, decimeter accuracy level. You can go into centimeters, but the decimeter is still mostly um, used. What we have today, um, I have not my um, camera, my consumer camera with me, but maybe you have those also. Now, GPS included in the, in, in the camera. If you want, you can load a map. I did it now for my travel in uh, Sri Lanka. And whenever you take a photo, it looks like this. You get the location on the right side of the picture. You get the location where you record your photo. And because in these cameras is also a compass, a simple one included, you know also in which direction you're looking. And all your pictures which you record have this location, we call it also geotagging. So it just gets a tag, it gets a, a mark where you know this is the location and this is where you're looking at. And if you visualize it in the map, 
or in, in, in Google Maps uh, forever, then it, it for, for example, then it, it looks like this. So you know where you have been and you know where you have been at which time because GPS records not only the coordinates, it also records the time. Yeah, airborne laser scanning, the next phase is then simply visualized here. We see the aircraft, we see a laser scanner put on the aircraft, of course also GPS included, and some inertial techniques. What is an inertial technique? This is basically a gyro and accelerometers. And if you have gyros, gyros give you the direction or directional changes, and accelerometers give you the accelerations and uh, you're able to get also position and attitude, so the rotational information, um, with a high frequency. And this was necessary for the development of la airborne laser scanning because these lasers, even at the early stage, 1990, um, they had already 1,000 to 10,000 measurements per second. So, um, of course, it's not enough, with, like with GPS, you get one position, one measured location, uh, every second or every two seconds. Nowadays, maybe three, five per second, but this is still not enough. So you need inertial techniques to at least as an interpolator between that and of course also for the orientation. Equipment, as we see it, uh, 1998 with a German uh, company who is operating this aircraft. We see here um, this yellow part is again uh, standing on the ground, uh, the, the yellow one on this tripod this is the GPS antenna close by the GPS receiver, uh, laser scanners, big boxes. You know, this time a laser scanner is something like that. And um, the cameras, the photogrammetric cameras used in photogrammetry had been also this big, 100 kilograms heavy. They were used. Um, camera, as I noted here, was still film based, but this changed then afterwards soon. So um, <laughs> that was equipment at this time and to equipment as it looks like today. I just give a, gave here a, a, a samples uh, of those. It, uh, that's a navigation sensor. This IMU might be as big as a hand, this orange box here. The red one is a bit bigger, uh, the dark one even, bit, even more big than the other one. And um, this is our navigation sensors and the scanners. Uh, you see a list of those or the cameras look a little bit different than at this time 10 years ago. 15 years ago. And what we see today, this is now these UAVs or thrones. Um, we see them um, flying maybe, and uh, we, we see that they use the same technology, the same mobile mapping technology again. They use GPS. If you use it in, in the geodetic field, you use DGPS, differential GPS, with IMUs, with cameras or la line lasers, and they are flying around of course, they are so far still very limited. They cannot compete with, a, with an aircraft, but you can do local areas. Let's say two by two kilometers or areas like this is uh, some feasible size here. The fundamentals, the theory behind it, illustrated simply now uh, this afternoon, um, we see here um, this, um, yeah, this toy in the center. This is my platform. So this is where I put all these sensors which I want to, to do mapping on it. And in navigation, we call this the body system. So this is where the, um, the, co the moving coordinate is. This is the navigation issue. We, we, must, we must know where is this when here all the time. This is our position task. And we must know the uh, rotation or the orientation of this blue uh, coordinate system, we must know where it looks at. And if we know this, then we can do um, mapping. And uh, basically the formula is then shown here. Um, it means that if we, if we have a tool for measuring a point, let's say this one, in this, in this blue coordinate system, this would be the vector which we measure. And then we have to rotate it and to move it with this location and we get the results in an earth fixed Earth-centered, even maybe if it's GPS coordinate system. So this is our mapping solution. In, if we have now more sensors, here they, in the first picture was just a navigation idea, but if we have sensors now included, a camera, for example, this frame here um, is one coordinate system. Then here is the this inertial stuff, so the accelerometer and the gyro, another coordinate system. The GPS antenna, another coordinate system. 
And finally, what we really want to have, this is the results, the mapping results in a mapping coordinate system. So we have a couple of coordinate systems, and this is what you learn in, if you go for the KDU South Campus and do the geomatics course there. All these coordinate systems, you must relate to each other, and um, you will learn it in, in the basic courses, and the formulas are even a bit more complicated if we look more closely at it and calibration is included and things like that. So these are details which I don't want to go through this afternoon. Yeah, now we go indoor. Outdoor GPS is helping us a lot. A lot. Indoor GPS, we know all, is not available. It's not working. Um, sometimes it's a little bit working, but you know, we don't want to use it or we cannot use it for mapping properly. But we have other alternatives as we heard in the first lecture this afternoon, uh, mobile networks exist, can be used also for positioning indoor, or wireless networks can be used for positioning indoor. They are to some extent used nowadays from indoor mapping, so for capturing the, 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 lo the environment indoor. Um, nevertheless, whenever you need them, they don't work. The VLAN is not running, Wi-Fi is not running, or the, the network is too far away, you know, these uh, stations from the telecommunications are maybe not, not so close and not this accurate as you want to have them. But still, this is research which is going on where people work on it. And um, it continues also here in, in this work. What is definitely remaining is that inertial navigation system again. Here we see the graph again, three accelerometers and three um, gyros, which are measuring um, accelerations and, and these uh, rotational changes. And we then have just the navigation task again to solve. We have to integrate the rotational changes. One gives rotation. And we have to integrate the accelerometer accelerations twice, as we learned in, in school, and we get the location. So basically, this is the idea. In reality, it's a bit more complicated. Yeah, where are we now? Now we are at a stage where we see that um, these geodetic solutions, as I call it, whenever you have a navigation sensor and a camera or laser scanner combined and you move around, um, it works. It has one problem, um, and the problem is that uh, these IMUs or INS, these inertial systems, have a high drift. And the cheaper they are, the bigger is the drift. So you can buy a gyro for, in euros or dollars, 50,000 euro, and you can buy one for one dollar. And uh, you imagine this is probably a very big difference. In robotics, we see another development. They call it robotics or computer vision. They call it uh, simultaneous localization and mapping. They use basically the sensor itself, let's say the camera, and uh, navigate around and then we have we have um, a problem to solve which I try to simplify a little bit in this way that we say assume we know where our take the camera it's not the laser assume we know where our camera is then uh, this camera ob is observing now the scene and we have two uh, the camera or the camera at two locations with the orientation so we can measure in 3d we can collect 3d this is um, one step, and vice versa. If we assume the 3D scene is given, then we can use uh, the 3D scene and do, in photogrammetry, we call it spatial resection. Uh, techniques like that, we, we define, we estimate from the 3D scene through our image, we estimate the location and the orientation. And uh, yeah, so either one or the other one is given, and uh, you can do always the complementary solve the complementary task and SLAM is now just this idea to say okay do it both somehow and I don't want to go now into all these details how to do that there's a big robotics theory about SLAM and it's very very interesting lots of PhD people are working there and will work there for the next 10 years on this issue I'm sure go to go further to examples yeah this is now like how these vans look nowadays or how they were looking, maybe the, the left one, the yellow one, five years ago. We see on the roof, we see cameras. Try to sh 
point to them again. Uh, we see cameras. Let's use this. No. Here, hopefully, you can see it. There is a camera. Here is a camera. Here is a camera. There's lots of cameras on this roof, and uh, this uh, this van is just has has just is just using two laser scanners. Here is one. Here is one. In the center, you see the GPS and this inertial stuff again. Put this on the roofs. This is the classical mobile mapping van nowadays. And in uh, you know the, the more recent developments are those ones like the one which we see on the lower in the center of the picture. This is now all combined. There is cameras around. We can see them. The laser is a bit more difficult to see, but it's here in the figure it's hidden. But I can show you. This is the laser here. Cameras around. The GPS included. Everything fairly compact nowadays. And um, the company who is uh, selling that, this one is uh, Leica, but there is another two or three or four uh, develop companies on the market which develop those. If the students do it in our university, it looks like this. This is their mobile mapping equipment. You see they took something from home with them, which you put at, the, at your uh, bicycle probably. But everything is included which you need for mobile mapping. We have antennas, even two in this case. This is the laser scanner. Here is the IMU. Even the odometer, counting the wheel counter, is included. And you can do the mobile mapping. What is the message behind? You can put it nowadays on almost each platform. And even students can put this together. You must calibrate a little bit. You must measure, you know, with respect to all these systems, you must measure distances. And the rest is then um, developed in terms of software developed to be used. Or another student project, they went on a uh, train in a park. And uh, here in this circle, we see the laser scanner. And here we see antennas and so on. Do a, a ma railway mapping exercise with the students. The other ones are more professional, of course. Laser scanner, um, which goes along, you know, which is on a boat here. Um, with the idea to, to capture here the Hubbard uh, Glacier or um, yeah, other, other vehicles you can see for mining, lower left, uh, another aerial um, aircraft type, small one, more a toy than a, but you can sit there, you know, you can fly this. We call it a gyrocopter, this, this aircraft, or the right the figure shows uh, the equipment on top of of a vehicle which is now for, you know, driving around here in this uh, golf area. It just shows it's flexible. You can put it almost everywhere. Software is available to capture data uh, interactively, so you can do lots of things manually. All these yellow lines which we see in this picture, just or here in this, this is two pictures, stereo, um, are used or digitized, re digitization results for mapping. So after, after that mapping result, you know all your roads, you know sidewalks, you know where is the uh, traffic lights, and whatever you capture is then in your database, in your map. Uh, yeah, um, examples from some research projects uh, which we do, do mostly together with uh, small and medium-sized uh, companies, enterprises, SMEs. And um, we see here, again, this is now how a point cloud looks like. If you resolve it a bit closer, you see how much details you capture through this laser scanning. That's huge. And uh, here we colorized it with the help of a photo. Um, the story behind this one is uh, that uh, the automobile industry in Europe is now starting to go towards autonomous driving. And for this autonomous driving, they need very accurate maps with lots of 3D details. And what they want to know is all these 3D details, like all these vertical uh, structures. So whenever there's something vertical, don't drive with a the car there, and also not automatically. And um, so collect this all and increase the existing maps. What we see in our classical navigation systems today is just a simple map, a little bit of 3D visualization. The next generation of 3D maps will be full of details. Uh, facades of buildings are included. Of course, all these 
um, infrastructure elements along the road will be collected or is already collected. And this is just a, uh, a, a some, some filterings and uh, image pro or point cloud processing, similar to image processing, where you detect small linear structuring elements and then if you visualize, let's say, only the vertical ones, it looks like this figure here. Yeah, here a bit more professional, all the uh, blue, all those vertical structures which are highlighted in blue here, these are the ones which we collected along the road. Segmentation of facades, um, if you, you know, if you collect the point cloud as we saw it before, it looks like this, like that one, which we see here. Just, it looks like a picture, just where we have s single points. Um, if we s do segmentation, if we do processing this, sorry, the wrong direction. If we do segmentation with this point cloud, we are interested to get the facade as a plane. We are interested to get all the windows and uh, yeah, processes behind that are, are from laser point cloud processing. Alpha shapes, for those who have an idea about that, are used here to extract those windows. And finally, they're just modeled, simplified um, by modeling in terms of uh, rectangular areas. Up another application also with the same point cloud, you see I'm using this point cloud just to indicate different examples. Uh, Solar potential, we heard just by the colleague before who showed about the carbon dioxide and all this stuff. Uh, we see that, um, um, yeah, solar pot collecting solar, solar information is one of the trends, of course, also a big trend in Europe. And uh, on the roofs, uh, this is nowadays done. Even Google has recently announced that they do it for all buildings, uh, you can collect uh, the solar potential on your roof. For the facades, they have more problem because they don't see it really. You need then information about the facades and the point clouds are quite nice information to do this. And to, with a little bit of tools, you can calculate solar potential on each day or per month or per hour or per year. You can calculate it. This is uh, two examples where we calculated the energy potential in, on the 22nd of March. Um, why in winter? Uh, in winter we would like, in Germany at least, to use it for solar um, heating or for collecting energy and uh, we need to heat uh, our buildings in summer. Um, uh, the, the, in summer we would like to collect the, en the same energy but m either for produce, putting it into the power system or to do it for solar cooling. Uh, of our buildings. Yeah, going a bit further to another application, this is our road. We want to know about where is all the, the cracks on the road. Here is a quite big one as we can see in the lower left figure or the, the potholes or the rats is what we, yep, thank you, I'm coming to the end. And um, what we want to collect, systems, uh, you know, again, with lots of sensors, vehicles, mobile mapping vehicles are available. They collect this. You can do it also a bit more simple if you just put it on the roof of a, of a van. Process it with image processing to detect the cracks and do this along the road. Or this is now such laser lines, if there is a laser rotating the laser lines and uh, you see here lots of height information available can be uh, processed and thresholded to see where is now the rats. Yeah, well finally, to come to the end, the most flexible platform maybe, and also something interesting for maybe you as a student at the university, why not use it just to put, take it into the hand, your mobile laser, and uh, walk around. Here we see a student who is walking around, has uh, the laser in the in its hand, an IMU included, and uh, you simply go like this uh, through your building, uh, walk along, collect uh, the point cloud, process it through proper techniques, and the result looks like this one. One level of, in one of our university buildings collected here, we see the 3D uh, structure, the, the top level is here cut that we see inside. Uh, one floor, together with the point cloud here, 
visualized, and this is then the 3D model which you can create from this uh, point cloud. And the very last picture, uh, now if you want to collect this in buildings, here is a hotel, the ground floor, there's lots of, do uh, of course, uh, rooms, and you walk from one room to the other, and always in this way. Uh, so it, it's uh, 700 grams heavy, this one. So one hour is okay, but five hours is like a good exercise for you. And uh, walk around, this takes maybe, takes one hour just to go through all these rooms, collect the information, process it to a point cloud, and you can use it for mapping. More or less, we see the ground plane already in this laser point cloud. The summarizing slide, um, we see in outdoor, we have a mature system with uh, mobile mappings, with laser scanners and cameras, and even radar and other ones is also used there. Indoor, the systems are not this much. Robotics has some systems with uh, cameras. All this uh, handheld laser scanner is now mature, but there is still ongoing work here, and the next five to 10 years will bring much more of those systems. And we see these uh, techniques which come from robotics and that from, from geodesy with navigation, they are coming together, more or less. This handheld scanner is more or less already a first combination of both. And in that field, we still have lots of things to do because I, I believe this is not the only handheld system which we will see in the market in future. Thank you very much for your attention.